So we discussed and we thought Dr. Mitra would be the right person to address the first inaugural session and tell you about some, give you some tips about journalism and how a journalist should be. And with this aim, we have called him and we expect that you would be learning from him a lot after his speech. Of course, you can interact with him also through the open session. And English journalism students, it is for other post directors to decide how they do. They have to submit an assignment of 150 to 200 words, whatever is happening this morning, and also in every orientation session. Thank you. As Dr. Jaitmani says, and uh, Dr. Joshi also says, that all the students of in all the courses at PIRA, radio, television, Hindi, and also with permission of Dr. Rani, the development journalism course, you all submit 150 to 200 word assignments to your respective course directors. Thank you. Now I request Mr. <coughs> Mr. K. G. Suresh to just give us a brief introduction and speak and <coughs> speak on the issue.
so long as parliament is in session i will not be able to give you one minute for any other program either it has to be after say in the evenings or on some weekends but not during parliament parliament meant he would give his full time to parliament so you see so whatever he takes up he would give his full time and i would also urge you to use your full time ask him questions in the coming session and i am sure you will all learn a lot from him we all need to learn a lot from him he is certainly one of the finest journalists this country has produced welcome chandanda the paper the pioneer the historic paper it was started by a businessman in kanpur called ellen and it moved from madhavad to lucknow and then to delhi and today he has made it one of the most readable newspaper through his entrepreneurship it was a very difficult task because when ellen thapar wanted to virtually close it down he took up the cudgel to say give it to me i will run it and he has done it very successfully to the pioneer is read not so much by the common readers they also do read it but is read everywhere who are the policy planners whether in the government or in the industry every word that appears in pioneer is keenly observed studied and analyzed so it's meant that an immensely readable paper and if you go through that paper you will find it is virtually compendium of the news of that day so with these words i invite dr mitra to please address our students mr kiri suresh so she wants to sir shangarwal hindi ko director mr joshi other members of the faculty IIT and all the students of various courses who are present here it feels nostalgic and happy at the same time at the warm reception you give me and the very kind words that have been spoken about me and my life's work which is embedded in the pioneer in india well Mr. Suresh and Mr. Sarkar know because they have both been writing for the Pioneer. Uh, not Suresh no longer that regularly. There is too many tasks at hand. But Mr. Shivaji Sarkar continues, and I hope it continues for the foreseeable future and beyond. You know, there is no specific thing that I have come to talk to you about. I have been broadly told to discuss the strengths of the Indian media and the techniques of journalism and what is expected from new entrants into the field. I can only tell you that journalism is a growing field. As you know, it is very coveted and the position in IIMC here and in Dhenkanal and wherever else. You are expanding. These are all very much coveted. There is a lot of competition, and I have seen this happen over the years. Earlier, you know, it was used to be said that one of my past editors said that you see, this is one profession which does not require any qualification. He said in his village, it used to be said that those who are absolutely, you know, useless, who have failed their civil services. Who have failed to get admitted into the police, who have failed to get admitted into the private sector, they go into journalism because it requires no qualification. Well, that was indeed the case, yeah. and many of them, mind you, turned out to be very good journalists because.
this is one profession where you really learn on the job. But I'm very happy to say that with institutions like IMC, and now there are so many journalism schools and colleges, newer courses are coming in, even Delhi University. The other day, I was told by a reporter that in addition to having various uh, journalism courses being taught in various DU colleges, the university is thinking of setting up a school of journalism on the lines of the Columbia School of Journalism. I am sometimes a bit worried that you see whether the quality of people who are getting in and who are coming out of these institutions are going to do any serious service to the profession. Because while journalism, as I told you, is a growing field, there is sometimes we feel overcapacity in some of the institutions and which are not really worth the degree or diploma they give. There are very few, like IMC, whose diploma is truly valued and cherished. And with eyes closed, I and the pioneer have always admitted all the interns, all intern applications that have come, and some of them have turned out to be very good. They are still working with, uh, with the pioneer. Our news editor and some other senior people are also from this institution. <laughs> so this is truly a tribute and the fact that this institution has grown from strength to strength. You had a very good faculty and now you have absolutely fine people at the helm. I have known Suresh and Shivaji for years. I know their ability and their dedication to journalism. You are talking about my dedication to whatever I do. I think this is nothing exceptional. Anybody who is a good person who is committed to his or her profession will be dedicated to it. And I have seen both of them be totally dedicated to the profession and try and do good and improve the profession. But today there are many new challenges. New media is coming up in a big way. When we joined the profession, even television journalism was not an option because we had only one channel in black and white and it was not even a national channel. Every metro had its own kind of centre and largely regional broadcasting used to happen. And radio journalism never really invited journalistic skills and it still does unfortunately. We are looking forward to the day when radio will also open up and it is very good that the Prime Minister has taken this initiative. Now he communicates with people on a monthly basis through his monthly bath and that has given a fillip to radio and officers in the radio have been telling me that there has been a huge spurt in the listenership of All India Radio. I hope that radio will also open up as a kind of a desirable option for young journalists like you. But till then, you have the print media of course, and you have television, and increasingly social media. Now social media as a profession is yet to develop fully. Social media is essentially an individual, an individual mode of communication. You have an opinion, you want to express that, you write a blog, you go on Twitter or Facebook, but it's very individualized, it's not institutionalized. But I can tell you, the day is not far when social media will also become an institution. There will be organizations specializing in social media. But that does not mean that any other branch of the media will suffer. For years, you know, I used to hear when television was opened up and satellite television arrived and it started beaming programs from across the world into our sitting rooms and bedrooms, people would say that, you know, the age of uh, print journalism is over, newspapers will suffer, magazines will close and it will only be television. It was in 1991 that television really opened up in that sense. And today we are in 2016. 
So nearly 26 years have gone by and print has actually gone from strength to strength. If you look at figures of the of advertising quantum, print is still ahead of the little. If you look at the mind share, mind share and time spent of various media, print is still ahead. And I'm not saying this because I'm a print journalist. I also appear on television and television is a very effective instrument of communication. But I think it is a long time before the print media gets replaced. We won't get it. We are running parallel, we are running in competition and print, television and social media will coexist. So don't worry if for instance you are desirous of getting a job in TV. I know most young boys and girls want to join TV because that is the glamour element and everybody hopes that they will become uh, you know, anchors and appear on television. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, you may be disillusioned because most of the work in television is done behind the scenes, behind the camera. Print, on the other hand, gives you a bigger opportunity, a greater opportunity to express yourself and express yourself through the pages of a print newspaper or a magazine so that you get your reaction to your opinions and your comments much more clearly than you will get on television. But yes, television has made new icons and right now two of them are fighting across Twitter and Facebook. Many of you may have seen two of my very dear friends are on a major ideological war on nationalism and what it, mean, what it means, who is a nationalist and so on. You know, Sunday I was actually at a seminar organized on the occasion of Munshi Premchand's birth anniversary. It was organized by Hans magazine. Hans was a very uh, respected magazine. Uh, in its time, it still is published, but um, it's a hit. Literary magazines uh, are, do not any longer have the same reach as they used to have. Hans, edited by Rajendra Yadav, was one of the most respected magazines of his genre, and they had organized the seminar. And the theme of the seminar was nationalism, democracy, and the media. And needless to say, the entire debate got hinged around the new kind of uh, quarrel that's going on over social media between the anchors and these issues that are coming up. I think it's a very good thing that if you're quarreling, quarrel over the social media. So you get your target audience, you have your opinion and voice because television does not sometimes allow you to express your opinion. But it is nevertheless, I think it's, uh, it's wonderful to see these people sort of fight each other as long as things are limited, confined to civility. I think it's useful that media items are now coming out and confronting one another on certain ideological subjects. And this is the shape of things. Believe me that as we progress newspapers, and the print media will be read less and less for news and more and more for views, opinions, background and so on and so forth. So those who have opted for print media, how many of the new entrants have opted for print media? Put your hand up. English in the board.
Khair. What I am saying is that increasingly print media will be giving out opinion, background, analysis and views more than the news. So you have to develop your writing skills in a way that you convey, you convey an opinion without kind of making it too shrill or something that may be offensive. So the skill your uh, lecturers and faculty will surely kind of guide you in this area. But you must remember that in print, more than news, it is the views orientation that is going to increase in the matter. So some training in that area is also required. And for television journalists, you know that there is this rush to be first with the news and everything is breaking news these days. That people kind of joke that uh, even if there is some kind of uh, hardly half an inch of water logging somewhere, the TV runs breaking news, water logging, heavy jam, heavy chaos. Well, of course, we've just seen what kind of water logging and what kind of chaos was caused on our roads, particularly in Gurgaon. But the one major criticism of television is that it tends to exaggerate and sensationalize. Now, when you join television, it will not be in your hands. You will be joining at junior positions and you will be expected to just give the news as it is or report from the spot. While doing that, you have to remember that exaggeration does not make for credibility. The one central and key element in news operations, be it print, television, social media, whatever, is credibility. If you don't have credibility, and in order to grab headlines, in order to get some kind of um, breaking news or coming first with the news, if you exaggerate, if you sensationalize, once people will take it, twice they will take it, third time onwards they will switch to some other media, either a newspaper or a television channel will be changed. So the credibility aspect is something that you must always remember and this is not something that can be really taught to you. We can only tell you, it's our job as your seniors to tell you that credibility is the key element and that means speaking the truth. The truth is at the center of news operations and news dissemination. And truth, as you know, will always be. Untruth can take you up to a point, but it's only truth that ultimately triumphs. I have been asked also to talk about some of the strengths of the Indian media. And when I talk about Indian media, I mean all, particularly print and television. Print a little more because it's been there for a much longer time. Have all of you read the preamble of the Indian Constitution? Have you read? Can somebody tell me what are the four sacrosanct principles that are mentioned right at the outset? Anybody? Yeah, come stand up. Who's Justice, most? liberty, party and fraternity. Justice, liberty, party and fraternity. Liberty, party, Justice, liberty, equality and fraternity. Very correct. Good. Thank you. I'll put it in the same thing. Liberty, equality, fraternity. These three principles were drawn from the French Revolution, as many of you may have heard. They are the 
essential ingredients of democracy. Liberty, equality, fraternity. And to that we added justice. So these are four principles of the Constitution which ensure India's democracy, this ensures the freedom of speech, this provides the right to the media and every other organ to express a viewpoint freely and fairly. But all these, there are institutions that uphold one or the other of the principles of liberty, equality, fraternity and justice. It's one institution, I feel, which enshrines all, encompasses all four, is the media. And that's why people say media is the fourth pillar of democracy. The others being legislature, the judiciary,
rushed food train, wagon after wagon of railways rushed to Kalahandi, food was distributed, the administration was told to ensure that not a single more death happened out of starvation. And did it. Today, if you go to Kalahandi, you will find a pretty prosperous place. Far from hunger and starvation, it is rice surplus. Rice surplus because serious effort was made to ensure that there is enough food being grown in that area so that the people of Kalahandi never suffer again from hunger and starvation. By contrast, let's take China. In China, at the time of twice, once during the Great Leap Forward experiment in 1962 and later during, sorry, 1958 and later during the Cultural Revolution of 1966. It is estimated that 30 million people, 30 million means 3 crore, 3 crore people died of hunger and starvation in China alone. In only one of the major excesses, the Great Leap Forward, when the Communist Party decided that they are going to industrialize China overnight. And Chairman Mao said there is no need to emphasize on agriculture. Everybody should make steel, everybody should make industrial equipment. And the backyard smelters that were set up with everybody in their overzealousness tried to emulate the official policy. People set up smelters in their own backyard to make steel, which was useless. You can't make steel like that. It's not child steel. So that was a complete failure in disaster and because of this emphasis on industrialization to the detriment of agriculture, 30 million people died in China. In India too, we had severe food shortages. But certainly, no famine of the scale of the Bengal famine of 1943. In independent India, there was a severe crisis in Bihar in 1965-66 and that was the time when it was said that India leads a ship to mouth existence because only after American ships carrying wheat docked in Bombay could the wheat be distributed, taken by train and distributed in Bihar. But all this thoroughly documented by the media and the criticism that ignoring agriculture will lead to this kind of crisis. What resulted from that? The Bihar food crisis was 65-66. And to overcome that, in 1966, the government launched the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution which transformed India's agriculture, which made Punjab, Haryana, Western UP and some of the northern states really bold, food bold, growing wheat and other cereals in large quantities. That green revolution spread to different parts of the country. And today, India is actually food surplus. It goes up and down last two years, we had a bad monsoon failure. So maybe from time to time, you have to import wheat, onion, potato, you've seen all this. But these are temporary discrepancies on the whole India as food surplus. <coughs> and again, it was the meat in India divorce. Thereafter, we had a free press. In fact, the press actually boomed. Far from being curtailed after the emergency and the kind of excesses that happened, press has boomed since then. A new type of journalism which explored deep into the interior, into carnism. Those days we had a lot of, you know, kind of caste carnages in Bihar. Earlier, prior to the emergency, we had more kind of uh, Babu type of journalism, very safe, absolutely only kind of cross-checking after twice and thrice. I'm not saying don't cross-check, but don't make a fetish of that. 
if you have, if there is good news, check it. If it turns out to be correct, right? You must push it and bring it forward. So what happened after the emergency? New type of story started. <coughs> Stories of these Khanids. How landed, landed aristocracy in rural India was oppressing the underclass, the peasants and agricultural laborers, setting fire to their villages, raping their women. Sadly, many of these things still continue. But that was the time from 1977 onwards that these stories started coming to light. So in a way, Indian journalism has been able to set new benchmarks every few years and bring in new kind of flavor with a purpose to the Indian system. And then came a phase of exposing corruption. Believe me, corruption in high places in India would never have been exposed but for the media. <coughs> the Beaufort scandal is very well known. It all started with a small item in a newspaper, quoting that Swedish paper, Dagens, Niger. Television. 
So very often television picks up some of this and television also breaks some of these categories. But this has had a great impact in terms of bringing a degree of financial probity. It has a stop scale. People will always try to find loopholes. But there is now a worry, a fear in the minds of scamsters that they may get exposed. And they have been getting exposed for a long time. I think this is perhaps the biggest service media has done to ensure or at least try their level best. You can't always succeed. I'm saying, you know, big corruption in high places has not stopped. Would probably not stop for many, many more years. But the fact that it's being exposed one by one has given credibility to the media and has also put fear in the hearts of many scamsters, scamsters who would not have bothered earlier to be careful while hugely pilfering public money. Then the worry that may get exposed. And also the public mood. And public mood matters a great deal. <coughs> it is because of these exposures that parties make it a primary point in their election plan. And now assure that they will work hard against corruption and win votes on that plan. This is, I would say, perhaps the most significant contribution by the media and I would expect all of you to be very clear, be uncorrupt that goes without saying, saying. but you must remember there's a certain thing the media has done with, to which you are expected to carry on the legacy. As I said, standing up for the underdog is going on even now. Whenever there are excesses, whenever there is oppression, whether it's in a caste base or community issue or even individual. Now I can tell you that this recent horrific incident in Buland Shahar, near Buland Shahar in Pasitu, you all I'm sure are aware of it. Anybody who doesn't know what I'm talking about, doesn't know what I'm talking about. So you all know. You think that without the media, without television going hammer and talk, without newspapers doing detailed exposes, anything would have happened. The police would have got activated. No way. All this has happened because of the watchdog role of the media and this is to its very great credit. And now I come to the last point I would make today. You know, in all this, in standing by the underdog, in evolving democracy, giving more power to the common man in the hands of the common man, which in a sense starts changing mindsets. Because of the ills and wrongs of society as exposed by the media, you have you have films like Three Idiots. All of you seen it? So then you see the rot in the system in various places, various phases, wherever it happens. The mindset against corruption, mindset against nepotism that we have to create. We are only halfway there. In a vast country, I agree, it's not easy to establish a common and uniform kind of system or common and uniform mindset. But because the media and its great role of in a sense unifying the whole country. India today thinks like one, which is not the case. When we had distinct, you know, kind of regional things, there was the Hindu in Chennai and Tamil Nadu and the South as a whole. The statesmen used to dominate Calcutta and the East. 
the Times of India dominated Mumbai as a West. Hindustan Times was the dominant paper of North India. And other papers were kind of there somewhere. But these were the four dominant papers in the four metros. And the flavor of all was very regional. You pick up these papers of say 30, 40 years back and you find a very strong regional flavor. Today, media is truly national. Something happens in Delhi or Mumbai, if media reacts to it, it spreads and spreads through the country. So media has acted as a unifier and unified the thinking process, thought process of the Indian people. And therefore you know how many people you can influence, how many people's views you can mold. And you have to mold it positively. You stand by the top, you have to campaign in your own way against divisive tendencies. And at the same time, you have to uphold and defend the liberty and our freedom and defend our freedom from attacks, from terrorism, from our enemies across the border, the media has to play a very significant role in safeguarding the nation. In a sense, you are all soldiers. You are soldiers of your neighbors. But nationalists, you must all be. And those who say that no, that is not a value worth pursuing anymore, I respectfully disagree. Without nationalism, you won't have democracy. <coughs> and if India does not survive, if India breaks up, where is all the democracy and where is all the dream that we are all dreaming of making the country great and prosperous, where will it all go? So along with all the commitment that you have, I urge you again to remember that nationalism is also one of the ideals that you have to remain committed to and do your level best to promote, propagate in your own. I think I will stop here now and invite a question. Some other time we can have a discussion on nationalism and the meaning of nationalism. But I think you all know what I mean and what is the kind of nationalism that we are expected to protect and promote. Thank you very much and all the best. And what we have been discussing, the nationalism remains the bedrock of Germany. Nationalism defends independence, defense, freedom, and freedom of all sorts, just not expression. Expression is just to express it. And what Dr. Mitra said is very important. Truth can never be suppressed. Whatever way you have to be a crusader for truth. And that is why he said, you are the soldiers for that particular purpose without a doubt. And it is a battle that you fight every day. He said, media set up benchmarks very often. And they have put up issues before the nation, they have unified the nation, and today, whatever the media speaks in Delhi, Chennai, Mumbai, Kolkata, Bhopal, Lucknow, Raipur, wherever it is, the entire nation speaks of that. Bulanshar is not the story only of Noida or Delhi, it is the story of the nation. So corruption will remain there because people will always remain greedy and you have to expose that and expose that with that heart of a student. And check and rechecking a story is often stressed but story should not be swept under the carpet because you can really not recheck the story properly let that come out. Because this is one thing you should remember. There is one aspect in the entire world of media.
that the media always has to deal with, that is the bureaucracy. And bureaucracy, what he was saying, the gagging of the press, more than the political power, the bureaucrats, they force the political powers to do that. So you have to fight a battle. And we did a story in 84, what Dr. Mitra was saying, in a small place called Orai in UP, where the story was, the editors of the local papers was really not the editor of the paper, it was the Daroga of the Thang. So we have to fight so many kinds of people at so many times. And still they have to stand direct and get to the truth so that no Kalahandi happens, no Bofos happens, no 2G happens, no 3G happens. So with this, now I request you all to put your hands up one by one so that you can ask your questions. And Dr. Mitra, whatever is possible. Yes. Yes. On Gurdjieff. So, sir, some time back I was going through a survey of Press Freedom Index where India stood at 138 number out of 180 countries, with the last at China and Korea, which are the dictators. So, I want to really know, I have two questions which are interlinked. Is media really, does media really enjoy liberty? As you said, media is very liberated in India. And second question is, as you are a member of parliament, a part of government, so isn't there an issue of media concentration in the hands of government? Okay. Of the government. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Please sit down. Your first question. No, I reject that kind of rating altogether. Altogether? Okay. No question. India 138 out of 180 yeah. is absurd. 135, sir. Sorry? 135. Before that, without borders, people Ah, whatever. I mean, uh, it's the lower half the index and um, rating, it is absolutely absurd because in my knowledge and experience, Indian media is among the freest in the world. Whereas even in the West, which boasts of freedom, there are various considerations, business and political party considerations, which I think prevent media from being truly free. I have lived in England for four years. And okay, it was a long time back, but still, one could see the way media used to present started news at the behest of the owners. In India, the great strength of the media is its diversity. There are so many newspapers, so many TV channels owned by different people with different inclinations that even if one paper or one channel tries to suppress something, another will remain. So, I think whoever has rated uh, India as in the 130th out of 180 is an ignoramus and has no idea of media freedom is all about. The second point about media concentration in the hands of the government, well, that's a separate argument. There can be a debate on that. But my having been member of parliament, I don't think uh, was, was in any way a reflection of that because I was MP for 12 years, of which I think about what? Nine years, it is the UPA which was in power, and I was still an MP. And then for three years, NDA came in, I was MP. You see, being a MP and being an editor, there could be. There could be an issue of whether there is a conflict of interest. That's a separate question, and I will be willing to answer, but let me uh, skirt it for the moment. <coughs> but just because somebody is an MP and uh, supports the ruling party does not necessarily mean concentration, media concentration in the hands of the government. I mean, I think in my paper. Yeah, sir, I see more news of Gumba water logging than the uh, floods in Assam, which is like a national crisis. Sir, do you think uh, media involvement or standing up for this underdog is lacking? With all due respect, sir, do you completely agree with your call that India thinks as one, India, media truly national? 
Can you repeat that question? Sir, uh, <coughs> sir uh, my question is, there are more news about Gurga water logging than the, the floods of Assam, which is not covered in the national uh, news. Uh, so my question is, do you think the media involvement or standing up for this underdog is lacking? Or the, the sir, do you completely agree with your call that India thinks is one and I media is truly national? Because I, sir, sir, I doubt it. Sir, with all your respect. No, you have to work together. Identify yourself. My name is Anita and I am a student of English journalism. You say, are they free to work together? Yes. Can you clarify what you mean by work together? Hello. Uh, sir, if, uh, suppose if I mean, uh, being a journalist, So if you contact somebody who is based in Tamil Nadu and you want some information, you can do that. So you can certainly approach and I would say in the majority of cases, a journalist always tries to help an journalist. A little better, but nothing stops you from approaching any journalist anywhere in the world. We have also small journalist calls. Please, I request you to ask them. Please stand up. Give the mic here, please. Gentlemen, uh, my name is Mariel Jimmy from the Republic of South Sudan. Uh, it is also a privilege for me to share and two questions, or to ask three questions for our guests of honor. Yeah, uh, based on what you explained, and uh, it may be so that you are beyond our level, but I need a quick question from you. Like, in the case of South Sudan, we have only one media or one television, which is the government television. Uh, in the side of television, if you are a journalist, a province journalist, you are talking something, but against the government, like insecurity in other areas, raping, and so on. Reaching on the desk of the managing director, he or she will hide all those information, cannot be passed to the public for consumption. In that level, what advice will you make is as the only one channel and is owned by the government, what advice do you give in terms of giving the information to the public on what is happening within the community or country? Then the second item is uh, we have many prints, the newspapers in the country, and the government has no newspapers. And the private newspapers owned by the other company. And they do talk a lot about what's happening, like the insecurity of the country, raping, corruptions, and the government been closing down all those private uh, newspapers. At the same time, they also arrest the editor chief of those newspapers. Based on your experience, and as you have been sent here to learn more, what advice will you give uh, to us from the developing country? Then the last question is, we do write the stories, we edit it, and we pass the third party, who is the managing director, for the tomorrow publication. Now, if the mistake comes within the news, maybe you misquote somebody. Like for our case, if I make a mistake by the name or the title of the official government or of the, maybe, uh, the interview, at times they arrest me, who is the reporters, not arresting the the head of the company. Based on your knowledge, should I be arrested as a, a reporter or the head of the company or the head of the newspaper to be arrested or to be summoned for further explanation? Thank you very much for listening and I will be eager to get more from you. Thank you very much. TV journalism. My question is, you just mentioned a while ago that truth can be postponed, it can be delayed, but it cannot be hidden and shielded. So I like to invite your comments on the recent, very recent Kashmir gathering. That's what my first question and second is, sir, that uh, you have welcomed the very new media that's a sh uh, social media. Now most of the print is going online. So this marriage between print and social media, how do you, how long do you think it can continue? 
and whether in a new, a near future print can yield to social media, like most of it can go online. Is that a, a imminent future that the print media is expecting? Um, our country and our system that yeah, okay, maybe uh, many things are inconvenient in the government. Many things the government would rather that the news did not come out. But we saw in Kashmir, I mean, what, what was not reported? Everything was reported and how even people uh, have got hurt and blinded by uh, these pellet bullets or whatever and um, the renewed spate of violence after the uh, elimination of Burhan Wani, everything and how thousands turned up for his funeral, everything was important. So I don't think that we can, um, you can say, and nobody seriously thinks that the government of India is in the business of suppressing the news. They may, in order to prevent any uh, communal and other tensions, may disable the... <laughs> कि हम जिस संस्थान आईएमसी में पहुंचे हैं यहां पे भी और कई बार हमें यह बताया गया है कि मीडिया लोकतंत्र का चौथा स्तंभ है मेरा सवाल यह है कि जब हम सोल्जर्स ऑफ पेन हैं या टाइपराइटर में हम कुछ लिख रहे हैं या कुछ लिख रहे हैं तो अगर हमारी भी एक पत्रकार की भी अपनी जिम्मेदारियां होती हैं हमें यह सिखाया जाता है कि हम निर्भीक हैं हम हर चीज कर सकते हैं हम आजाद हैं हम सब कुछ लिख सकते हैं लेकिन जब हम इंडस्ट्री के अंदर जाते हैं तो शायद हम यह सब कुछ नहीं कर पाते तो मेरा सवाल यह है कि क्या हमारे निर्भीकता के पीछे या हमारे निर्भकता के साथ क्या हमारे दर्शकों और पाठकों की कोई जिम्मेदारी नहीं है कल को अगर हमारी निजी जिम्मेदारियों के बीच में हमारी हत्या हो जाती है या हमारे साथ कुछ भी हो जाता है तो जिस तरीके से सोल्जर्स को सम्मान दिया जाता है उन्हें शहीद का दर्जा दिया जाता है क्या पत्रकारों को ये समाज ये देश दे सकेगा
uh, emergence of social media is the sensationalization of news. So, uh, and, and uh, often we see that the news providers say that the viewers are wanting these kind of news and the viewers say that they are, they are being provided these kind of news. So this is a classic example of the chicken and egg paradox. So how can we deal with this? Thank you. Right, true. I don't quite get your linkage of 2014 elections and how much suicide is have been an ongoing phenomenon. Your second question is a very interesting one because there is really no convincing or conclusive answer to that. You know, long years ago I remember that uh, once Ramanand Sagar, many of you may have heard his name, he was the producer of Ramayana um, serial and many other films. He was asked that why did you make these masala films? He said the public, because the public likes it. The same thing that you are saying now, that why do you have this kind of uh, news because people like it. There is no real measurement. I must tell you there is no real measurement and nobody really knows what people like and what people don't like. Ultimately you have to make a kind of intelligent guess. Because on television also this TRP is a very dangerous uh, thing. It is absolutely incredible sometimes. You know, there's every news channel claims they are number one. No, it's not possible. You can't have four or five channels that are number one. Uh, there has to be only one number one. And But we don't have any conclusive proof of any of that. And the kind of news that is doled out is very often this commercialization, this uh, more of glamour and so on and so forth. But there is... Uh, My name is Jyoti. And uh, right now I am a radio journalist. My question is, if the media is really affected by the politics, and it is, uh, whether it is influenced or not from the politics and political parties. Thank you. He also in a sense depends on the writer or Dr. Surabhi the year to present a memento to Dr. Chandan Mehta.
Shri uh, Chandra Mitra ji said. And sir, again, we are extremely grist, uh, thankful to you for gracing this session. And certainly, we expect that you will be coming again to address these people.